Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. The Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations in Saskatchewan is calling on the Vancouver Police Department to do a full investigation into Kawakatu's First Nation member Chelsea Poorman's death and to issue an apology to the family. Poorman went missing in Vancouver in September of 2020. Her remains were found last month on April 22nd in Vancouver. Vancouver police announced last week the remains of Poorman had been found on the grounds of an empty mansion. Investigators say they believe she likely died on the property the night she disappeared or shortly thereafter, but went undiscovered because the house has been vacant for years. Police said her death is not suspicious. The family has raised numerous concerns over the way her remains were discovered. FSIN says Vancouver Police Department must do more to investigate, quote, what truly happened. It's day 22 of the search for a missing five-year-old boy on a Saskatchewan First Nation. RCMP and leaders at Red Earth Cree Nation say they're not giving up on finding Frank Young and ask for continued prayers after hopes were once again dashed over the weekend. 200 volunteers remain on the ground and five to eight RCM boat, RCMP boats are on the water at any given time. A helicopter is on the scene every second day. Searchers have had to contend with high river levels as well as wet, muddy and cold conditions. RCMP Sergeant Richard Tong says crews discovered a pair of boots which were at first thought to belong to the missing boy, but this was not the case. On Saturday, May 7th, <clears throat> the RCMP team patrolled approximately 40 kilometers downriver. Two small boots were located and confirmed by fa Frank's family members to not be his boots. Many First Nations are underwater right now. Residents in Hay River, West Point First Nation and Kat Katlodiche First Nation in the Northwest Territories are evacuating because of extreme flooding. Over the last few days, more than 250 evacuees have fled their homes for higher ground. Record high water levels and ice jams along Hay River have led to swift action, including the rescue of two community members trapped on a roof. Drone footage shows extensive damage to properties and impassable roads. An evacuation center has been set up at a town hall meeting, uh, and a town hall meeting updating residents will be taking place this evening. We have all of Old Village and some of the elders all at the Denny Wellness Center. They, they're over in the town of Hay River at all the hotels. It's just the people that are on higher ground that are still home in the community. So we're sending them, you know, to families' homes or to the wellness centers. Some of them are in town. They don't have no cooking places. So they're basically all the logistics are working on, like, to, you know, help them with some food. Um, so we're working on all of that. Over to northern Alberta, where hundreds have also been affected by flooding. Some members of the Dene Ta First Nation have been evacuated from the community of Chate, just three hours south of the Northwest Territories Alberta border. According to the Dene Ta Facebook page, roads are quickly deteriorating. A nearby reception center has been set up for evacuees, and some temporary flood mitigations like tiger dams have been implemented. Kaseshawan and Fort Albany First Nations in Ontario have also been evacuated to two other communities because of flooding. The two communities have evacuated hundreds of members to various communities around northern Ontario, including Thunder Bay. Indigenous Services Canada says the Canadian Armed Forces will support the evacuation of First Nation communities impacted by spring flooding along James Bay and Hudson Bay, including Kaseshawan, Fort Albany and Attawapiskat. NDP MP for Timmins James Bay, Charlie Angus, asked in the House of Commons when residents will be permanently moved to safer lo a safer location as was agreed to in 2019. 
people in Kishetchewan and Fort Albany were scrambling to get planes in order to get families to safety. Now, the government knows that the dike wall is at risk of a catastrophic failure, and yet every spring they gamble with people's lives. An agreement was signed to move the people to higher ground, and yet they are still on the floodplain. So my question to the minister is simple. When will the people of Kishetchewan be moved off that floodplain and moved to a safe and secure future? Now, Indigenous Services Canada says they are working along with Ontario to identify and transfer provincial lands to Canada for a future relocation. Meanwhile, in Manitoba, nearly 1,900 residents of Pegwas First Nation have now been evacuated with more rain in the forecast. In other news, the Governor General has returned home. Mary Simon is spending the week in Nunavik, the Inuit territory in northern Quebec. And her first stop is her hometown of Kujuak. Tom Fenario has the story. Wow. The proper way to address the Governor General is Her Excellency. Except most people here don't know how to translate that to inuktitut. to it. Besides, most people here call her just Mary. Hi. Simon was the recipient of a hero's welcome from friends and family. I married her brother, Johnny May. Mary was uh, my very best friend as we were growing up. And when me, I never expected she would come up that high, but she did. I'm so proud of her. Yeah, and we miss her though. Rangers, order, arm. There was also some pomp and circumstance, northern style with the Canadian Rangers serving as a guard of honour. Earlier in the day, Simon met with Nunavik leaders. It's really great to, uh, to be here. Uh, I can remember, I, I always tell Wit that I don't get excited hardly ever. I just, I'm a quarter on an even keel. But uh, when we were about to land here yesterday, uh, I was thinking of my uh, early childhood when I was a young teenager, especially after we were at the camp on, on the George River, we would be f coming here and we would be so excited we were almost squealing. So I kind of felt like that yesterday. <laughs> Pita Atami is the president of the Makovic Corporation, the body that represents Nunavik's interests. Atami used the occasion to speak on how Quebec is holding up Inuit self-determination. Being in Quebec, we have had issues. We're still hoping that Quebec will need a negotiator to the self-determination file. Canada is on board. Simon says she recently met with Quebec Premier François Legault, and he not only promised to appoint a negotiator, but to build a much-needed hospital in Nunavik. A hospital where they can actually do surgery, because right now everybody has to be shipped out for any emergency <clears throat> major operation. Simon's visit will also include stops in Kangasujuak, Kangasujuak, and Nugjuak before ending on Friday. Tom Fenario, APTN National News, Kujuak, Quebec. Thanks, Tom. We have to step out for a quick break, but there's much more to come. Stick around. Welcome back. Yet another report has been released that describes systemic racism and violence against women in the RCMP. Misogynistic, racist, and toxic. This is how the Canadian Feminist Alliance for International Action Report, released Monday, describes Canada's Mounties. Previous reports have also found a similar culture within the RCMP. Here's what NDP MP Leah Gazan had to say on Tuesday. The findings are there. They've been found and reported time and time again, yet this government lacks the political will uh, to act. If this government is serious about addressing systemic racism in policing, they have the answers. Now it's time for them to immediately act to save lives. According to that new report, the evidence of systemic discrimination and violence against women perpetrated by the RCMP is shocking and it is growing. Pam Palmeter is a co-author of the report and she joins us now. Pam, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. 
What were some of the things that stuck out for you when uh, preparing the report on the toxic culture of the RCMP? Well, when we were doing the research, we were, you know, we expected to find some similarities and some trends, but not to the extent that we did find. Like every single report identified sexualized violence and racism in the RCMP. Every single report that we found was calling for some kind of external review and that people addressed the predators actually weed out the predators because the other thing we found that was shocking was that in even though there's so many class actions they in fact never got rid of the predators the people who are committing the sex crimes how does the culture within the rcmp impact indigenous women well, think about it on two fronts. So within the RCMP, you've got some Indigenous women who are RCMP officers or contract staff, for example, and they were specifically targeted by RCMP officers, some of them presuming that they might have been abused when they were younger, so they'd be easier to target. And then think about Indigenous women and girls outside of the RCMP. And we know that the RCMP are the majority policing force of First Nations, for example. Not only have they fallen down on investigating murder to missing Indigenous women and girls, but they themselves have been engaged in acts of violent sexual assault against Indigenous women and girls with almost complete impunity. There's like no recourse for Indigenous women. As you mentioned, you know, there's been numerous reports, class action lawsuits over the years. What's it going to take for there to be change within the RCMP? Well, I think that's the key question, right? Because all of this that's happening in the RCMP amounts to an abuse of power for racial motives, sexual motives, whatever it is, it's an abuse of power. So you have to look at who has power over the RCMP, right? And this is the federal government. The federal government is the one that's tasked of making legislation, making regulations, overseeing its own institutions, and they've failed to step up and do that. So what we were trying to do is synthesize all of these reports, show Canadians that this isn't just about statistics, this isn't just about hiring practices, this is about real sexual violence, physical harm, and long-term mental trauma to thousands and thousands of women across the country, and they have a legal obligation to stop it. As you say, you know, politicians, including the minister in charge, say there is no place for the behaviors you described in the report and promise reform. Uh, what could they be doing? Well, there's a lot of things they could be doing. So first of all, they could have done an investigation and weeded out the thousands of predators from across the country because we know from some of the reports that there is sexualized violence in every RCMP unit at every level in every corner of Canada. They, they focus more on their public image according to the Auditor General, and settling these claims than they have on weeding out the predators. If they did that, that alone would have a significant impact. But they also have to look at how they do policing, where they do policing, and truly independent oversight, because we don't have that now. Uh, so those kinds of things would go a long way towards ending the violence. Pam, we'll have to leave it there, but uh, important report. Appreciate you speaking with us about it. Thanks for covering it. To Iqaluit now, where the city has received a report from engineers outlining exactly what went wrong late last year when fuel was discovered in the city's water supply. As it turns out, the culprit was exactly what they thought it was. Early into the investigation, the city identified an old fuel tank that was buried full of fuel next to the water treatment plant. The engineers confirmed that abandoned tank was the source of fuel in the drinking water and left the Calouite without tap water for nearly two months. Calouite's mayor is still calling for a third-party review of the entire response, including the government of Nunavut. Uh, and then hopefully the, the, the outside independent third-party review of the entire um, event can happen. Um, you know, something I, I still feel uh, very firmly about. We, we need to do that and make sure that, uh, um, you know, whatever errors were made, if there, if there were errors made, um, you know, and, and how to uh, avoid these things in the future. Residential school survivors from Muskawagan First Nation in Saskatchewan would like the Pope to visit them. But as APTN's Leanne Sanders tells us, they will have to wait to hear if he will make a stop in their community this summer. 
The Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations held a news conference yesterday calling on the Pope to visit the last standing residential school in Saskatchewan that just closed its doors in 1997. Archbishop Don Bolin of the Regina Archdiocese, who is part of the conference, says the delegates who traveled to Rome and got to hear the Pope speak firsthand described his apology as transformative. Well, it's been said over and over again, the truth and reconciliation final report says apologies are not an end point but a, a starting point and uh, so that the assistance of the Pope in moving us to those next steps is really important. Survivor Roland Desjarlais spent eight years in the school and wanted Archbishop Bolin to see the school and grounds where he describes doing child labor. Well many of us we're on our knees for hours and hours in those gardens, uh, picking bugs and spraying bugs and hoeing potatoes or hilling potatoes. And it was some sort of an experience that uh, we, can't, uh, we can't forget. On the right-hand side over here by the old building over there, there was a, a barn over there and uh, where all the uh, animals were. And many of us got, uh, many of us, uh, got punished over there. We went up into that loft and uh, we came down limping and crawling. Archbishop Bolin says he just returned from Rome where he says the Pope is in poor health. Bolin believes he may only visit a few Canadian sites this summer. If he can't visit Muskowagon, there are plans in the works to take survivors to wherever the Pope stops. I hope that the visit can address the needs and wounds and concerns of survivors, uh, that it can be a really transformative experience that can, you know, help us to move from apology to direct actions of solidarity. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Saskatoon. Time for one more quick break. Coming up, a profile on a competitor in the Miss Universe Canada competition. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. This amazing photo of the Northern Lights was taken by Iris Flat. This was her view on Sunday night outside of her home in Barrens River, Manitoba. Thanks for sharing, Iris. If you have a great photo, send them to us uh, by email to share at aptn.ca. The opportunity to be featured as our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at Wednesday's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, 16 and sunny for St. John's, 23 in Fredericton. Plus 2 with rain in Kujuac, 13 in showers in Nain. 26 in Montreal, rain and 23 in Chibugamu. Showers and 20 in Sault Ste. Marie, 26 with rain in North Bay. Sun's out and 18 for Thunder Bay, 17 in Sioux Lookout. 12 with showers for God's Lake and Puckettawagan. 16 in Winnipeg, Gimli, and Dauphin. 14 with showers in Regina, sunny and 20 for Saskatoon. 14 with rain in Buffalo Narrows, 17 for Meadow Lake. A rainy day in northern Alberta, 13 in high level, 14 for Grand Prairie. Showers in 16 in Edmonton and Lethbridge. Rain in 14 for Vancouver, 17 in Kamloops. 12 with showers for Prince George, 10 and rain in Smithers. Plus 8 for Old Crow, 1 degree warmer in Whitehorse. 6 with snow in Yellowknife, 8 and snow in Norman Wells. Minus 4 for Saks Harbor, plus 2 in Politak. Minus 3 in Chesterfield, plus 1 with snow in Arviette. Minus 2 in Resolute, 6 below in Aglulink. Lanny Hool is Plains Cree in Silix Okanagan from Goodfish Lake in Alberta and Vernon in BC. And she is competing this week in the Miss Universe Canada pageant in Toronto. She's getting a little mentoring from a famous former Miss Universe. APTN's Chris Stewart talked to Lanny Hool about the upcoming competition. 
Lani Huell says she has looked up to 2015 Mrs. Universe winner Ashley Collingbull. Collingbull was the first Canadian and Indigenous woman to ever win the competition. When Lani decided to compete in the 2022 Miss Universe Canada competition, she reached out to Ashley for some pointers. She says Collingbull took her under her wing and helped virtually and in person to help prep her for the competition. Right from day one, she has been nothing but kind and supportive in every way possible. Um, she got me really prepared for this pageant and I'm looking forward to it. Collingbull says she was happy to help. There was no one that was there to help me. There was no one that was chasing the same thing. And now like I'm in a position where I can actually like help her get sponsors, help her feel comfortable and train her and prepare her and, you know, make her feel like she doesn't feel alone and also make her feel like she's just owning the space. And Collingbull helped teach Lanny in runway modeling and interviews and told her to pass on what she learned to other Indigenous women. It's all about that positive ripple effect and you know when I help other women like as I'm helping Lanny she's now helping other women and there's other girls reaching out to her that are saying that they're so happy to and inspired to see her chasing her dream and they feel like they can do it too and that's that's what it's all about. She always tells me and reminds me that um, if you're, it's okay if you're the first, but make sure you're not going to be your last. So she's really helped me along um, with this journey in, to becoming Miss Universe Canada. And then it's going to be my job after this to continue that legacy, to make sure that I'm not the last one. Collingbull will be in Toronto by Lanny's side when the finals begin this Saturday. People can vote for Lanny for the People's Choice Award at MissUniverseCanada.ca. The winner will represent Canada at the Miss Universe competition. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Good luck to Lanny. Well, a new episode of Face to Face is just minutes away, and our guest tonight is a survivor of abuse and addiction. Twenty years ago this week, after many years in the throes of addiction, Roland Vandell hit rock bottom. But instead of being the last day of his life, it was the beginning of a new one. Today, the author and former boxer works in the front lines with those struggling with addiction, mental illness, and homelessness. I have to be empathetic to the cause and what they're going through. And, and the biggest problem, especially in social services, is, is, is not necessarily people that haven't been there before, but even if you haven't been there before, it doesn't mean that you're the smartest person in the room. And the facts are, is if you think you're the smartest person in the room, you're probably the loneliest person in the room, right? Because, you know, just because you don't understand what somebody's going through. I've sat with homeless people and they have, they have two degrees, you know what I mean? Like, right. like uh, they're brilliant people. And that full interview is just moments away. Despite talking about some heavy topics, we also had some good laughs. Thanks, Roland. That's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Tuesday. For more, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. Dennis Ward, thanks for being with us. Stick around. Face to Face is next. Have a great night.